All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Joseph, and uh, I think we'll start today's workshop. So once again, thank you all for being here. And all right, so uh, later, uh, throughout this workshop, uh, I hope you've already set up the uh, files. If you still have any problems, uh, feel free to, uh, feel free to, uh, if you're in the live audience, uh, feel free to ask uh, any, of, uh, any of us here. Or if you're online, uh, feel free to just ask in the chat, all right? We'll try to assist you as uh, well as we can. All right, so throughout this workshop, we'll also be using Slido to uh, answer any Q and A's. So uh, the code is 3056850. Um, it will be in the Zoom chat as well. You should be able to access it from there. Okay, so today's workshop, uh, it's, essentially, it's essentially broken into four parts. First of all, we'll be covering um, the motive. Uh, model fitting through scikit-learn and we also learn how to test and validate our model and finally we'll also have a hands-on session to improve the model all right so without further ado let's get to the first part of today's uh, workshop which is um, essentially going through linear regression and trying to think about how we can motivate the idea of machine learning all right okay so first of all we need to think about something here and that's something is what is machine learning we hear this word a lot it's a very um it's like a buzzword it's like a hype word these days you hear it a lot but what is it actually so if you do a quick search online and uh, this is actually taken from a data science website called towards data science you'll see that it says machine learning is a branch of computer science that's concerned with the use of data blah 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 blah, blah. so essentially if you just um focus in you see a couple of points it's trying to imitate human learning it's trying to make predictions by learning from the input Okay, so, okay, some points there, but not too useful, right? I think we can all agree. So in that case, let's think of what is not machine learning. Sometimes thinking about not examples are in fact better. So what is not machine learning? And throughout this workshop, we'll refer to what is not machine learning as traditional or conventional programs. So um, in the conventional program, we essentially provide a set of rules. So for, uh, I think most of us here are familiar with like at least some programming language, be it in Python, Java, or C. So when you write programs, oftentimes you use if while loops. And if your entire program is based upon that only, then odds are it's a conventional program and it makes predictions. It generates an output strictly based on the rules that you gave it, that you've given it. Later, we'll see an example of this. And that's how it will make a prediction. So for example, let's say you want to uh, write a program to determine if this is a cabbage and to determine if the other one's a rock. So you give it either one of this and it needs to tell you whether uh, one is a cabbage or one is a vegetable and the other one is uh, a rock some, or some type of stone. Okay, so how would we do that? One way, a very simple way is if it is green, then we say, okay, cool, it's a vegetable. And if it's gray, then it's a rock. Uh, that's a very naive way. And we can see how that could go wrong in 10,000 different ways. But that's a start. But what I'm trying to say here is that is how maybe one might try to approach this type of problem using a conventional or traditional program by just looking into if else. Okay? So having fixed rule statements. So this is the point that I'm trying to convey here. All right. So um, now let's have a look at what is machine learning. All right. So in a machine learning program, we actually provide both the input. Uh, we both provide both the input and the output, all right? So yeah, we provide both the input and the output. And uh, from um, the machine, essentially um, tries to figure out the rules um, based on looking at both the input and the output. So um, in this is where we call uh, what, and this process is what is known as training, all right? So uh, what this tries to do is that you feed it some input in machine learning. So you feed it some input and you actually also tell it the answer. This is the very important bit. So when we're using conventional programs, we might not tell you the answer. We don't have to because we know the rules. Um, we know that um, like just now the one, if it's green, then we just say it's a vegetable. But in the case of machine learning, we actually provide it with an output, all right? We provide it with an output and we'll try to figure out some rules, some mapping in between the input and the output to give you the best prediction possible. So that is uh, machine learning in a nutshell. So if we go back to this problem here about determining whether something is a cabbage or something is a rock. So a machine learning approach 
maybe is to just tell them, uh, we give them like 1,000 samples of vegetables or uh, cabbages and another like 1,000 samples of rocks. And we try to ask it to figure out what uh, the pattern is. So maybe the machine learning program might be able to see that, oh, if it's a bit rounder, if it's greener, it has some curves, then yeah, maybe that uh, suggests that it's a cabbage. And maybe if it's like coarser, it's rougher, it's gray, it's not green in color, then it's probably a rock, right? So that's one way uh, we, uh, the program might learn. We don't know for sure, and we won't get too deep. Uh, in fact, we won't really be touching on image recognition today. That's another type of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that we'll be using. But uh, in, um, in this case, it doesn't use linear regression, which is what we're covering today. But this example, I hope it conveys to you the differences between a conventional program, a conventional approach versus a machine learning approach. All right. Okay. So moving on. So in, uh, to just quickly summarize it, tra traditional programs, they have predefined sets of rules and they don't require training. But for machine learning programs, uh, there might not be a clear pre predefined set of rules. Later, we'll see that there are still rules, but it's not as straightforward as um, the traditional programs one. And it will definitely require training because it needs to figure out a mapping between the input and the output, all right? So I hope that gives you a good overview. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at some examples of machine learning. So obviously the one that we'll be talking about today, linear regression. So uh, some of you might be like, hey, you can actually solve linear regression using machine learning. Yes, later we'll see how we can do it. Um, there's also logistic regression, uh, which is just another type of regression, just different shapes, different curves. All right. Then there's also uh, support vector machine algorithms. Um, so this is used for classification. Um, yeah, don't worry too much about these. Uh, today we'll be mainly focusing on linear regression, but I'm just putting this out here so that we can see a bigger picture of what uh, machine learning actually comprises. And there's also k-means algorithm for clustering. The interesting thing here is that uh, out of um, all these four, uh, k-means is quite interesting in the sense that it's actually a bit more of a newer, a more advanced technique, where this is actually called unsupervised learning. Um, to give you a brief insight of what that would mean, is that if you look at uh, the, the plot here, you just look at this, uh, if you just look at this uh, plot over here, you'll see that, hey, it's not exactly clear like how we are gonna cluster them. And when we train it, we don't actually tell it the answers. We just, it just goes by an algorithm and it tries to figure out the op uh, optimal clustering to get three clusters. Um, for all we know, um, that might not be the best case or the program doesn't really know that that's actually the answer. It just tries to figure it out. So it's different from the others in the sense that in the others, what we call supervised learning, it's actually we give them the answers or something known as the labels and they try to figure out the mapping. But in this case, unsupervised learning, it really just looks at the input and tries to figure out an optimal output without actually knowing the answer. All right, so finally, uh, the last one is uh, deep learning or um, also um, it's part of neural networks, which is actually what most of, I believe what most people are thinking about when they first uh, hear about machine learning. So it's like this uh, neural networks here is, uh, tries to emulate the structure of the brain where like each of the, uh, each of the nodes there, like they try to like um, mimic the properties of like a neuron, uh, so on and so forth. Not to say they're doing exactly that. In fact, uh, there's a lot of discussion on actually new, this type of neural network structure may not be the best at emulating uh, how the brain works. Um, but we won't be talking about that today, but essentially these uh, examples here, they're just providing a big overview. And hopefully from here, we see that what we're doing today is really introductory. We are really just looking at linear regression, which is really the tip, the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so after I told you so much, then the question becomes, why are we talking about linear regression then? Like there's so much more interesting stuff there. Why talk about that? The reason being is that linear regression is simple. And I want, and we want to start off this uh, workshop, this, uh, uh, this training here with something simple that can help us to motivate, to help us see how we might rediscover the idea of machine learning on our own without actually like uh, looking it up or hearing it from other people. Like imagine like if you never heard of machine learning, how would we try to come up with it? All right. Okay. So here, linear regression in the simplest form that it can be, 2D plots. So I think all of us here have tried to draw, uh, have tried to draw a basket line some point in uh, secondary school life in some science class for practicals or labs. So uh, we want to, the goal here is to draw a good or the best best fit line that could be. So one might try to draw, and this might be a first guess. Doesn't look too bad, right? Doesn't look too bad. Um, but 
I think we can all agree that it can be improved. And if you try to just, just you know, when you draw, you use a ruler and stuff, you try to just balance it out, you realize, okay, this might be a bit better. It seems a bit more balanced. But the question becomes, okay, we're comparing between these two. But to make a fair, to make an objective comparison, we need a point of reference. So this point of reference would be able to tell us what a best or a better best fit line would be. So how do we think about this point of reference? How do we come up with something like this? How do we provide an objective comparison? So to do that, we need something called a metric, which is really just a number in this case that calculates like how far off the actual points are from the line. All right. So one very natural way to define this metric, to define, um, to make this calculation is to look at the vertical distances. It's very natural because the predicted points are all on the line and the actual points are the blue ones uh, that we see on the screen. So it's very natural for us to want to just find the vertical distance because it represents the error between the actual and the prediction. All right, but here's a nuance and a subtlety here. Oftentimes we will square this error. The reason being is that you realize for the darker colored ones, these are negative errors, meaning they're like, um, so, or in, okay, actually no, these are positive errors in the sense that um, the predicted values are greater than the actual values. So they're positive. But if you look at the gray ones, the lighter colored ones, the error, if you take the predicted minus the actual, you get a negative value. So if you just naively sum them up, you'll be underrepresenting the, the error because the, the positive and the negative errors cancel each other out. And we do not want that because that's an underrepresentation, which will make our calculation inaccurate. All right, so we don't want to do that, um, which is why oftentimes uh, we look at the squared difference. And in a very succinct form, it's written like this. Don't be afraid of this um, math notation. It really just means the difference between the predicted and the actual value. And as for the um, reason that we mentioned just now, we square it, okay? All right, so this is the metric. Um, the end point in this case, we only have four points, so n is actually four in this case. So we're just looking at the sum of the squared errors. Uh, for four uh, for four cases, all right. And to optimize this, um, to so you see the way of thinking about this is that we want to reduce the error as much as we can, right? So one way to think about it is that we want to minimize this metric as much as we can. And to minimize it, um, this technique is actually very well known. In fact, uh, it's known as the method of uh, ordinary ordinary least squares when it comes to solving this type of linear regression problems. For those who of you who are more well-versed in this area of math, you will know that you can actually solve this analytically, meaning there's an exact way of solving it, um, but we won't be using it this way. It's good that you know, and maybe if you know it, uh, later you can try to compare it against how the machine learning way does it. But um, in this case, we won't be assuming any knowledge about that, so don't worry. All right, so today, we'll actually be looking at a more general idea in machine learning to try to tackle this problem that we have. Okay, so if we revisit this metric here, so just now we mentioned, our goal is to minimize this metric. And let's give this metric a name. It feels weird to just call it a metric. Let's call it the cost function. Why do we call it that? So imagine you're a firm, you're trying to make a prediction. And if every time you make a mistake, you're either oversupplying or you're undersupplying. And in that case, you're losing money. So there's a cost there. It's costing you something. Or sometimes it's also called a loss function because you're losing stuff. Right, and we want to minimize as much as we can. I hope up to here we're all clear with that. So the goal is to cons to find a best fit line that minimizes the error, um, that minimizes the cost function in this case. All right. So if we look at it from a more mathematical standpoint, we all know a line is given by y equals mx plus c gradient and intercept. Not a big deal. And our our goal here is to come up with a way to minimize this. So once again. Uh, I've rewritten it in a way where, so the cost function, just I call it the metric, right now just realize that it's only dependent on M and C. What does that mean? Your line, when you're trying to come up with a best fit line for this, you're really just messing around the gradient and the starting point, the y-intercept. So when it comes here, notice that the xi and yi, this looks very complicated, but actually the xi and yi are info that you have. So if you come to think about it, you already know what, um, each point is, we know that there's like a point at two, four. If you look here, we know there's a point at zero, zero, there's a point at two, one, point at two, three, point at four, three. So this will constitute the X, I, Y, I. So the only thing that we're changing is the M and the C, all right? So in fact, uh, for this particular case, we can actually try to visualize the cost function. 
And uh, this is something that I uh, plotted out in GeoGebra. So if we give it a moment to load, so you see that it's actually not that complicated. It's really just a 3D plot, a 3D plot, and it's a parabola in 3D space, all right? So uh, don't worry too much about this, um, but the, why am I showing you this? It's because this helps us to I, understand the idea where this is our cost function, right? And we want to minimize it, meaning we want to get somewhere down here. Will we actually get all the way to the lowest point possible? Later we'll find out. But um, in general, that might not always be the case. But in this instance, since there's only one uh, lowest point and it's a very well studied, well known shape of parabola, it's something that's very well studied. So all this um, will actually lead to the fact that we can actually reach the best minimum point later as we continue. But here, I hope this conveys to you the idea that graphically, we're really just trying to find the minimum point and reach it uh, on this curve here, all right? Okay, so if we go back to the slides, all right, so now, how do we reach that minimum point? That's the million dollar question, right? So um, to do that, we apply something called gradient descent. Now, gradient descent, some of you might have heard of it, some of you might have not. If you haven't, don't worry. Uh, I'll try my best to explain it in this workshop and we'll actually explain through a very intuitive way. So gradient descent really just means to descend this curve that we have here just now, and you want to move downwards as much as we can to this minimum point here, all right? Okay, so uh, how do we try to understand this? So just, um, if this is your first time hearing about this, just imagine that you're an ant on this curve, all right? So imagine you're an ant on this 3D parabola. You're on the surface of it. And your goal is to reach the lowest point of it. So as an ant, you're on um, the parabola, but there's one more catch. You can only move in the horizontal plane. You can only move in the X, Y direction, or in our particular case, the M and C directions. So the question is, which direction should the ant move in so that you will reach the minimum point uh, the quickest? All right. So that's what gradient descent starts to find out. All right. So the gradient descent algorithm, I'll just put it here and I'll, um, I'll just list it out first, then I'll go through it in more detail. So the idea is to just pick a random point, any starting point. So um, it could be a good guess, it could be a bad guess. We can see how that affects it later, but essentially it's just a guess really, okay? It's just a guess. So in this particular case, this black point here, where the end initially was, it's the starting point. It would be our P naught. So um, in, to be even more specific, it will be M0 and C0 because we are varying the M and the C in the cost function. Then afterwards, so don't worry about how to calculate this, but the idea is that we can calculate a vector because do remember that we're dealing with 3D space. So it's not that easy to just talk about a gradient, but we can call, consider a vector that, con that contains the gradient, um, some information about the gradient at least, and we call this, um, so this is called NABLA, but don't worry, it's just a gradient vector. So it's just a notation type of thing, okay? So for those of you who know multivariable calculus, we're essentially taking partial derivatives here, but don't worry too much. And afterwards, you can generate the next point by applying this recursive formula. All right, so let's just quickly break down what this is. So imagine if you start off with P naught here, right? If you start off with P naught, then you come, uh, at this point, this would be P naught, and you're trying to generate P1 out of P naught. And realize that um, everything that on how we can get to P1 is just dependent on like uh, some information about the gradient vector, about the gradient of the curve. And this K here, this K here is oftentimes known as the learning rate. Um, it just really means how big, um, graphically, it means how big of step you want to take in that direction. So if you have K to be massive, um, you can see how that might go wrong. Because let's say your ideal value for M and C is one and one. But if your K is a thousand, you can see how you might be overshooting and like the values, something's going to go wrong because the values are going to be too big and you'll never really get to the point. Later, we'll see a very clear example of what it looks like in uh, in our validation or like when we code it out, what would it actually look like? So here, uh, don't be too worried about this. Um, often um, later when we use scikit-learn, all these are coded in for you already. But I hope that through showing you this, um, we get a bit of a better appreciation of what this is doing. So to help us understand better, uh, oh yes, so we repeat this. So because it's recursive, we repeat this, but to help us understand better. So imagine you're the end here, right? So this, so once you apply gradient descent, what you're doing is that you figure out the direction and you move according to that direction slowly down the curve until you reach the minimum point. So if 
Uh, the math seems a bit scary for now. Don't worry. Just I hope the main takeaway here is that we're moving down the curve based on uh, the direction given to us by this uh, algorithm here. Okay. All right. So uh, this is where we will just uh, take a, a quick look at the notebook and we can actually try to run it hands-on. So um, if we go to the notebook uh, here. All right. So I uh, hope you asked already have this set up. We'll be using uh, everything up till uh, this point. Essentially, you just need to be concerned with these two lines of code. So this is the data that uh, we have in the plot. All right, so I'm gonna run, uh, okay, let me just connect. And I'm gonna run everything up to um, before this point. Just give it a moment. Uh, if you all have this notebook set up already, uh, feel free to run with me. And uh, we should be able to get the result. And the reason why we should run this is because you can actually make some very fun tweaks with it later. Uh, if we have the time. All right. right. So uh, by using uh, this platform here is Google Collab. Um, it's really like a, a really convenient place for us to test out uh, machine learning code um, on Google's uh, CPUs and sometimes GPUs for more intensive calculations. All right. So once you've run everything up to this point, you should be able to generate these plots. So you realize these are very similar to the slides. So here we have uh, iter, here just means iteration. Um, and then you have the squared error and you have the, and you have the equation of the line. So our first guess could be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 for both the, vector, for both the gradient and the intercept. And you realize as you apply this, uh, algorithm, you real, uh, you realize something. Okay. Yes. Actually, wait, I forgot to change this one moment. Okay. So you rest, they, just not, I'll go back to that example in a bit, but just, uh, set the learning rate, uh, to 0 0.01, uh, in case if it's on 0 0.1, set it to 0 0.01. Okay, so you'll see that actually in this case, the square error goes down very consistently. So it went from three to 2.6, uh, 2.654, then to 2.44 to 2.337, 2.35, 2.34. All right, and you realize, yeah, the lines do start to look better. And if you run this many times, uh, don't worry, the, uh, it won't show everything when you start running for a large number of iterations. It'll just show you the final result. You see that, hey, it actually leads to a very nice plot here. All right, so just something to take note, uh, make sure the learning rate is set to 0 0.01. And okay, so we realized that, okay, in this case, is this actually the best? Um, one way to test this, right? One way to test this would be to, if we just go to this, uh, to the um, cost function here, and we just look at the point, all right, so we, the equation is 0 0.75 and 0 0.25. So 0 0.75, 0 0.25, and 0 and 2.25, you realize that that's actually the minimum point here. So this is consistent with our belief. This is actually consistent with uh, what we would think uh, it, how, how it worked because it actually reached the lowest point here, all right? So uh, in this case, we can see that this is a success, all right? So... Um, now, just to mention why things might not work out as we would expect if we have the learning rate to go from 0 0.01, which is a small number, to a slightly bigger number to 0 0.1, okay? So if you, any of you try to run this, or if you saw me running this just now, you realize that something odd happens. So for the case of 0 0.01, the error goes down consistently. But for the case when you put 0 0.1 as the learning rate, which is the K in the equation just now, you'd realize that, hey, something's off here error went from 3 to 5.5. That's not supposed to happen. We want it to go down. We want to reduce the error, but why on earth is it going up? All right. So, uh, and you realize that after one goes from 5.5, it goes to 2.9. Okay, that's a bit better. Oh, wait, no, it's go back to 5.4, so on and so forth. It seems to be oscillating. It doesn't know how to proceed. So what's going on here? Let's try to investigate this phenomenon a bit. So I'm going to move back to the slides. Um, if you have the notebook on your laptop, on your devices, feel free to play along with it. But okay, so if we go back to this and we look at this equation here, so notice the learning rate, this K here is denoted by the learning rate in the code, all right? So now, if we have a closer look, this, remember I said the K is like the, the size of the step that the N takes in that particular direction. So you see these arrows here, I deliberately drew them to be quite small. But what happens if the arrows are gigantic like this? You know, if the arrow is huge and you realize that this actually overshoots the minimum point and it actually goes like all the way seems to be like outside the curve. What this means is that there's nothing down there. So the only way for there to be a point on this curve is to go up. And that's not good because we want to be going down, not up. So this is actually 
um, graphically, intuitively what's happening when you're setting the learning rate to be too big. You're telling the program, the end in this case, to take a gigantic step and it's overshooting, which is why um, the default learning rate for most machine learning algorithms would be set at 0 0.01. Um, there are instances where you might want to increase that or decrease that, but um, that's, um, we'll cover that maybe next time. But in this case, I just want to uh, give uh, all of you a brief understanding of why uh, just now we saw that it fails or it doesn't perform as we expect when we have the learning rate to be 0.1, okay? All right, so essentially we've come more or less to the end of this first part here. So here we have um, the model, the sample of what you would kind of expect from the, um, after running the iterations. So from the code here, from the collab, you can run, uh, I think you can display up to 49 or 50 of these plots. Anything above than that, it will just show you the final result. So you can see that um, when you reach like 500, um, okay, no, this is the point. Let me go back to the good learning rate, not the too large one. All right, uh, when you come here and let's say this 500 and I go 600, you realize that nothing really happens because it's actually already reached the minimum point. So if you think about it, because the steps are considered in terms of the gradient, right? The gradient at like the minimum point would be zero. So um, mathematically speaking, if you look at this equation, um, if you look at this equation up here, if the gradient here is zero, then you realize that um, everything here is zero and you'll be the next point and the previous point will be the same, all right? So yeah, that's um, mathematically, that's what's happening, but don't worry about it. Essentially, graphically, just think about it as it's reached the minimum point. All right, so um, this essentially concludes the first section. I hope this um, helps us to understand how we might have come up with machine learning on our own in this linear regression example. So a, key, a few key takeaways, okay? We found the best solution to this linear regression problem, a very simple problem that we could have solved analytically, but we use a machine learning technique, in particular gradient descent, to solve it and realize we did actually find the best point, the best uh, parameters for this line. All right, I hope we can all agree on that as we saw from the curve there. All right, and why do we like this? Because notice we've throughout the whole thing, we've only talked about two things, cost function and gradient descent. So we defined a metric, we defined something that we want to minimize and we applied some algorithm to reduce it. That's all that we've done. And why is that good? Because that's very generalizable. So anything, any problem that you can think of that can be coded into this idea of uh, reducing the error, reducing a function, reducing the cost function here. And if that cost function is not, uh, in, in a math sense, it's not like too, uh, too jagged or something like that, um, as long as you can differentiate it or there's some algorithm to help you to locate the minimum point, in general, you can solve it using this technique. So this just, just doesn't just apply to the linear regression problem. So if you recall from the examples, for like logistic regressions, for like k-means clustering, for classification, for even neural networks, this idea from this idea of cost functions and um, descending the co uh, the cost function curve, it really forms the backbone of modern machine learning um, today. All right, um, and it's very much used in like even more advanced techniques like neural networks. So this concludes the first part. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put it into Slido, and I think we we can uh, take some of them right now while uh, I set up the Kahoot, uh, a, just a quick quiz, just to have a quick recap, all right? So if you have your phones with you, uh, please uh, have your phones out. We will have some fun with Kahoot as well. All right. Okay, so, okay. So let's just do a quick recap of what we've gone through. Okay, uh, machine learning tries to imitate human learning, true or false. Take note, I'm not saying that it's doing what humans do, just saying it tries, all right? Okay, we think we're around 48 people, so 43 responses, okay. What? All right, okay, true, okay? Um, it does try, okay? Uh, for those of you who answered false, and maybe you got confused with the fact that, is it actually doing uh, what humans do? No. There's a lot of uh, journal articles being written about how it needs to be improved. All right, for example, learning from feedback and stuff like that. But we won't delve into that today, but it tries, okay? It's really trying its best, right? All right, so scoreboard, okay, nice. Okay, I saw Red Van. Okay, Barra Fan Club is not on there, unfortunately. Okay, uh, second one. Machine learning algorithms are always better than traditional algorithms. 
right? So, yeah, I guess this depends on which side you stand on. But I think in general, anything of an always statement is it's a bit too strong. Okay, um, there are instances where machine learning doesn't really work that well. And in like the case of like linear regression, um, if you can solve it analytically, you might want to do that because sometimes it's more computationally efficient. All right. Okay. So, all right, leaderboard. Okay, more or less the same. Okay. All right, next one. Okay, which of the following algorithms use unsupervised learning? So all the, these four are like the four options in our um, examples. Yeah. So linear regression, I think, I hope no one chooses that because we literally saw how it learns from both the input and the output. So we gave it an answer. So anything that uh, requires you to give it an answer um, while training would mean that it's uh, supervised, okay? Um, the only one here is k-means clustering that uses unsupervised learning, meaning it tries to figure out uh, the answer on its own solely from the input. So it uses a math, um, it defines the cost function sometimes based on like, um, like the centroid or like the center of all the points and it tries to optimize the positionings of that. So yeah, just, it doesn't really know the answer while it's learning. Okay, so scoreboard. Oh, okay, some changes. All right, cool. Okay, next one. Okay, all machine learning algorithms learn only from the input. Okay, yeah, there should be quite a giveaway as well. Okay, nice. Okay, the, most of them learn from the output. Uh, only actually for unsupervised learning uh, algorithms, they, then they only learn from the input. For supervised, they definitely need the output as well. Else they, it's kind of like, you know, you're studying for a test. Uh, you read the textbook, you need to know what's the right answer from the textbook. Else, oftentimes, you can't study for a test. All right. So, cool. Okay. Leaderboard. Well, that's constant. Okay. I saw red when very, okay, very consistent. Okay. So, like the cost function that was used in the linear regression example. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, just think about, so all these represent differences uh, between the predictor and the actual. Uh, just... Some look very similar. All right. Uh, yeah. Just pick okay. one. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah. So I'm not saying that they're different. Okay. Okay. The values are different, but um, minimizing either option blue, yellow, or green would give you the same thing. But uh, I'm just, that's why the phrasing of the question is important. Uh, used in this example in the slides, it was yellow. Okay. <laughs> this is a trick question. All right. But um. Conceptually, blue, uh, yellow, and green. Um, later, you actually see them uh, when Glenn uh, talks about uh, valid, um, how we can uh, evaluate how good a model is. You'll see all, all, the, uh, all the three, I think, of blue, yellow, and green. But uh, A is actually what we call the uh, absolute difference. Usually, we don't do that because uh, if you guys are familiar with uh, absolute values, they don't really give the best. Um, like There's like a very like sharp turn uh, it, when uh, it reaches the minimum. So this doesn't have nice math properties in some sense. All right. So, okay, cool. Wow, okay. Okay, I think there are around two, more, two or three more questions. Okay, the higher the learning rate, the better. True or false? Yeah, I think just now example illustrated that quite well already. Okay, false, okay. Yeah, so yes, this doesn't... People get confused. They feel like the faster it learns, the better. But no, in this case, the learning rate represents the step that it takes. All right. Well, okay. I saw red when the first place. Very consistent. Cool. All right. Two more questions. Okay. Uh, higher learning rates could be suboptimal because. So why is that bad? So just now I said that it might not be good. So why might this be bad? Uh, I hope the fonts are not too small. Essentially, red ones overfitting, blue ones uh, learning too quickly, yellow one says it might convert too rapidly, green says it might not convert at all. Okay, yes, so the answer is, uh, yeah, okay, we haven't talked about overfitting. I'm not sure, I don't think we'll get to it in this workshop. Maybe we'll touch a bit on it, but essentially um, overfitting just means that it's learning too much from the data. But actually, if you see when it comes to high, when the learning rate is too high, it's not that learning too fast. It actually doesn't really learn. Like it doesn't know how to converge to the minimum point, okay? All right, uh, so now uh, last one, I think, last question. All right. Oh, someone's been dethroned. All right. Okay. Yeah, last question. Let's see if anyone can make a comeback. All right. So what does this uh, gradient uh, vector function thing represent in the gradient descent formula? 
right? Red says steepest direction, steepest ascent. Blue says direction, steepest, uh, blue is the steepest ascent. Red is steepest descent. Yellow is the rate of the algorithm, learning rate. And green says reciprocal of the learning rate. All right. Okay, yes. So this is a trick question because it's gradient descent, but note, uh, actually, um, so notice how in the formula it's a negative because this part represents the ascent. That's why we take the negative of it to find the direction of a steepest descent, okay? So trick question, not easy. Yeah, all right. So that's all for the Kahoot. So now uh, we'll move on to the next part and I'll pass the time now to Pan Pan. All right. Right. Um, hi, everyone. So after we have gone through the theory side of machine learning and linear regression, right? So let us see how we can use this knowledge in the real world example. Right. So the problem that we are going to look at today is the life expectancy prediction. Right. So there are many features that, that can affect life expectancy, be it adult mortality, um, infant deaths, alcohol consumption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today we are going to look at how we can use these features to help us predict the life expectancy value using the linear regression model. Okay. So for any machine learning project, right, what we need is the data set to start off. So for today, we are going to use this data set from WHO and United Nations. All right. So for any of you, if you are interested in the data set, you can always access this link in the slide, um, as well as in the notebook that you'll be using later on. Okay. Okay, so what we are going to do now is to go back to our notebook. Okay, so now we are at the notebook now, right? So first thing that we need to do is to import our data, right? And to do that, we are going to use this library called Pandas. So Pandas is the library that can help us to manipulate our data and explore our data. And one of the important features of Panda is the data frame, which help us to deal with the structured data. So we can think of the structured data as um, the data that we can represent it in a table format, like your Excel file or the .csv file. Okay. And the data frame, basically you can think of it as a form of table. Okay. And to use our Panda library, we are going to import the library. So the normal convention here is to um, use import pandas as PD. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run this line of code. Okay, so now I have imported the library. Okay, and now I'm going to connect my notebook to the Google Drive so that I can access the material from my Google Drive. All right, so um, this is being done using the first two lines of code. Okay. And after that, I'm going to specify the path to the data set. Okay, and in this case, we can see that our data set is in the .csv file. So we are going to use this function called um, read csv to read in the .csv file. Okay, and I'm going to run this block of code. Okay, you can just click connect to Google Drive. Right, and once you are in this page, you can just sign in. Okay, and then you just click allow. Okay, so now we have successfully imported our training data. Okay, so let's us see how our data frame looks like. So this is our data frame that we just imported just now. We can see that there's so many 
numbers, right? So many columns and stuff like that. So let us see what these numbers actually mean and how we can use all these numbers to um, train our model. Okay, so I'll now switch back to my slides. Okay, so this is the their frame that we just imported just now, right? So you can see that um, there's these two numbers. So basically the number of rows and columns. So there's 1,649 rows and 154 columns, right? So this tell you how big or small your their frame is, okay? There's also this row, right? So basically each row, is representing a data set from a particular country. And how do you know that, right? You can see that there's many columns representing each country. So for example, this column is representing Turkey, right? So let's say if this particular row is from a country called Turkey, then what is going to happen is this number is going to be one telling us that, oh, this particular row, particular um, data point is from Turkey, right? But in this case, it's zero means it's probably from other country. Okay. And then we have um, these columns, right? Representing our predicting variables. So these are the variables that we are going to pass into our model um, to help us predict the life expectancy value, right? So our life expectancy value is the target variable, which is something that we are going to predict, okay? All right, and if we look closely into our, sorry, if we look closely into our data frame on top, right, we can see that there's this very weird column called, un called unnamed, right? And we don't want this column to be in our data frame because um, it is not relevant. And if we were to pass this into our model, probably it's going to affect our model performance um, in a bad way, right? So we are going to remove this column so that our final data frame is going to look something like this, where you can see that the number of column decreased from 154 to 153 because we removed the first column for unnamed. Okay, so I'll switch back to my notebook. Okay, so I've got a question. Can anyone name the kind of encoding that is used to encode the country? Oh, it's called one hot encoding. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so basically, if a, if a data set is from, sorry, is a, if a data point is from a particular country, then the column, the value of that column will be one. Otherwise, like the rest of the other columns will be zero. Yeah, so that's how one hot encoding works. Okay, so I'll move on. So just now we wanted to remove the, the our third column, right? So what we can do is to use this function called um, drop, right? As the name suggests, we are dropping something, okay? So the function takes in the name of the column that we wanted to drop. And then here we are specifying the axis equals to one, meaning we are dropping a column not a row. So if we are dropping a row, it will be axis equals to zero. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run this line. Okay, so let's visualize how our data frame looks like now. We can see that the unnamed column is removed, right? And the number of columns decreases by one. Okay, 
And for sanity check, we'll just um, look at the first five rows of the data frame using this function, right? So df dot page. Okay, and we can also get the information of our data frame, right? So to print out the information, we just use this function dot info. So I'll go ahead and run. And then we can see that we can see some information regarding our data frame. So we can see how uh, many rows there are, right? How many columns there are. And then our first, our, the name of our first column and the last column. So if we were to go back to our data frame, we can see that the first column is a year, right? And the last column is uh, status development. Okay, so that's our first and last column. Um, We can see the data type as well. So there's load and also integer, right? And that actually aligned with our data frame, right? We can see that uh, some of the columns contain integer values, whereas some other columns contain uh, float values. Okay. All right, so just now we have dropped our column, right? The unwanted column. What we are going to do now is basically to um, drop all the rows that have missing value because we also don't want any missing value to be in our data set. Right, so... Okay. So let's say that I have this um, example data frame, right? There's three row and three column, minusing the, the first row. Okay, we can see that our data frame contain missing value, right? So this is the missing value, right? So our first row contain one missing value. Our second row has two missing value, right? And our last row is, is pretty good where it doesn't contain any missing value at all, right? So what we want at the end stage of our data frame is for it to contain all the rows that don't have any missing value. So to do that, we are going to use this um, function called drop in A to basically um, drop all the rows with missing value. And then in place equals to true just means that we are modifying the original data frame in place. Okay, so our final data frame in this phase, after we run the drop in A function, it's going to be like this, where it only contains the last row. Right, because there's no missing value. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on. So normally, um, what we are going to do before we drop our row, right, is, is to check whether our data frame actually contain any missing value. So to do that, we are going to use um the is and a function to basically detect whether something is a is a um is a missing value. All right, and we we are summing the thing to basically count the number of missing value in each column. Okay, and as we can see here, based on the uh, limited number of columns being shown here, we can see that all of it is zero, right? Meaning that in each of those columns, there's no missing value. Okay, so it seems like our data frame don't really have um, any missing value based on the um, some of the columns shown here, right? But um, just for the educational purposes, I'll just run this anyway. Yeah, so just in case there's any missing value, right? So after running this line, basically we have already dropped all the row with missing value. So I'll just print out the info of our data frame, right? And here we can see that um, the number of rows is still the same, right? 1,649 rows, meaning that even before running this line to drop, right? Um, our data frame actually didn't contain any missing value. So that's great. Okay, and I'll just visualize our current data frame. Yeah. Okay. So 
after we have pre-processed our, our data frame, right, what we are going to do now before passing um, the data to our model is to split the data set into two parts. Okay, so the two parts will be the train set and also the validation set. Okay, so we can think of our data frame just now that we have, right, as the original data, right? So what I'm going to do is to split the original data into two parts, the train set and the validation set. So for the train set, I'm going to pass this into the model, right, and fit it um, to the model. So after that, the model will probably recognize some patterns in the train set, right? And then I'll then use my validation set to validate or evaluate my model performance, right? So an analogy for this would be that if you were to be studying for an exam, right? What you are going to do is to probably study the past year papers first, right? And after you have study enough past year papers. So in this case, your past year paper is the train set, right? After you have studied enough past year papers, you probably recognize some patterns in your past year papers, right? And to, to validate how well you have learned, I'm going to use the validation set, which is probably like a new um, exam paper that you have never seen before, right? And ask you to attempt it and see how well you have learned, see your performance. Right. And I probably wouldn't want to validate your performance using the same past year papers that you have practiced because there's no point, right? You have already seen the questions. Okay. So to split our data set, we are going to use this function called train has split. Okay. So the function takes in the predicting variables, the target variable, and then the test size. So in this case, we are specifying the test size to be 0 0.25. So 25% validation set and 75% um, training set. Okay, so let us see how we can do this in our notebook. Okay, so to use the, the function, right? I have to import the function. So I'll, I'll use this um, live code. So from, SK learn model selection in code train test split. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run. Okay, and before that, we need to extract um the predicting variables and also the um, target variable, right? So our target variable in this case is the life expectancy column, which is something that we are going to predict, right? So um yeah, I'll just extract the life expectancy column and then assign it to Y. And then our predicting variables are all the other columns that is not um, life expectancy, right? So just now we have gone through this function as well when we drop our unwanted column just now. So you just specify the column name and also the axis, right? Okay, so I'll go ahead and run. I'll visualize my Y. So it contains only one column, right? The life expectancy values. My X, right? You can see that um, the number of columns decreases from 153 to 152 because we just dropped the life expectancy column. Okay. So I'll go ahead and um, use this function, right? Pass in the X, Y, and also the test size. Okay, so now I have already split my data set, right? So just to see the shape of my data set, so you can see that the chain data, right, actually contains a 1.2K number of rows, whereas the test or the validation set actually contain a 400 rows. So it's around 75% to 25% or three to one. Okay. And last step before we fit our model, I'm going to scale. Uh, 
I'm going to scale the data, right? So uh, for today, I wouldn't be able to go through into details what um, this actually means and why we are going to do this, right? But basically just for you to know that um, this thing actually exists. So I'm going to use the standard scaler. So basically the standard scaler, assume that all your features, all your predicting uh, variable uh, is actually like being normally distributed. As you can see on the left uh, graph, right? So what the standard scaler is going to do is to scale all the features such that every single thing is centered at around zero with the standard deviation of around one. Okay. So similar as what we did just now right to use the function we will import the function so i'll go ahead and import and then i will initialize the scalar okay and actually if you are interested um, in knowing more about this right i actually provide a link here so you can access um, these resources to learn more about it okay so i'll go ahead and scale my x train and x test Yep. So after that, after we have scaled the data, now we are ready to pass the data to our model, to fit our model. All right. So the model that we are going to use today is the um, linear regression model called SGD regressor. So I'll go, go ahead and import the model. Okay, and now I'm going to initialize the model. All right, so once we have initialized the model, we can start to fit the model, All right? So we pass in our training um, data set, right? The X train and the Y train. So I'll go ahead and run. Okay, so we have successfully fit our model. Okay, so let's try to use our model to do some prediction on our X test, right? So this thing is the data set that the model has never seen before. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run and I'll visualize the prediction, right? So you can see all these random numbers. These are the prediction, the live expectancy value that the model has predicted, okay? But now we also don't know like what these numbers actually mean, right? It's just some random, value, we don't know whether it's good or bad. So now Glenn will walk us through what these numbers actually mean and how we can improve our model performance. Okay. okay. So now I'll be going through the last part of our workshop, which is model validation with scikit-learn. So now that we have already uh, predicted our response variable, how do we know whether these predictions are good? So in other words, uh, how do we assess the performance of our linear regression model? All right, so uh, there are actually many metrics that we can use to assess the performance of our linear regression model. But for today, we're just going to introduce uh, three of the uh, main ones that uh, most uh, data scientists would use. And the first one would be the coefficient of determination, otherwise known as R squared. So the proper definition of R squared, I won't go into too much detail, but the intuitive definition would be just uh, how well our linear regression model fits to the data. So if R squared value will range between uh, in between zero and one inclusive, and one me meaning uh, it will be the most perfect fit and zero meaning it will be the worst possible fit. So how we can calculate the R squared from sklearn is, from the SKLN library, we are going to use the R2 score function from the metrics module. Yeah, so, so I will do this later in the collab notebook. All right. So the second metric that we'll be using is mean square error, very similar to uh, what Joseph mentioned earlier, which is uh, very similar to the cost function. But with the cost function, we're just going to divide it by the total number of uh, data points that we have. So it's basically just the predicted y value. Uh, sorry, the actual y value minus the predicted y value, and then we square it to account for the negative values. 
sum it all up and then we divide it by the total amount of data points that we have. And then we should get a mean squared error. And how we can calculate the mean squared error from, uh, from SQLite would be to, from the SQLite library again, from metrics module, we'll be importing mean squared error function. Okay. And the last metric that we're using would be root mean squared error, which is as, as simple as, as, it, as it sounds, it would be the square root of the mean squared error. All right, so, uh, so why do we square root the mean squared error? So uh, there'll be a more uh, clear example later, but mainly why we square root is so that the units that uh, whatever the response variable is in would be uh, more easier to interpret. So for example, if the root mean squared error is 6.7 kg, then on average, our model will be predicting weight with an average error of 6.7 kg. Yeah, so I'll be uh, going through the example in Colab now. Okay. Okay, so for, for this line of code here, what we're doing is from the SQLint library from the metrics module, we're gonna import the mean squared error function and the R2 score function, right? And we're also gonna import NumPy. Okay, so, so to calculate mean squared error, we will just provide the function and then we'll provide the two uh, values, basically the predicted values, which is, um, sorry, the actual Y values, which is Y test and the predicted Y values, which is Y pred. And this function should calculate the mean squared error for us. Similarly for root mean squared error, now there is no uh, function in the SQLint library that can calculate root mean squared error for us. So we have to do it manually. For, so from, we will do, we will import NumPy and we'll use a square root function to square root the MSE instead. We get a root mean square error. So for, R, for the R squared, we'll be using the R2 score function. Similarly, we will pass in the actual Y values and the Y predicted values, and it should calculate the R squared for us. So if we run these two lines of code, we should see that the mean squared error is 4.134 years squared. Now, this is the example that I was talking about. So it's very difficult for us to interpret what year squared is. So it would be natural for us to square root it to get the root mean squared error, which is 2.03 years. So now it'd be more easier for us to interpret that uh, our model is actually predicting uh, life expectancy with an average error of two years, All right? And R squared in this case is 0 0.94, which is very close to one, which is almost a perfect fit. So in this next line of code here, what we're doing is we're actually just plotting. On the x-axis, it would be uh, values from zero all the way until the length of our, the number of uh, actual y values that we have. And we're just gonna plot it against uh, the y prediction values. And so we run this line of code here. You will see that the blue points are actually the predicted values and the y are actually the uh, actual values. So you can see, they are quite similar. Yeah, so the model has done quite a relatively good job in predicting the life expectancy values. All right. Okay. So now that we have went through how to assess uh, our model performance, so the question now would be, is this our best performance, correct? Can we do something else to improve our model further? So, I'll be talking about hyperparameter tuning, right? So before I talk about what is hyperparameter tuning, I want to mention what hyperparameters are. So hyperparameters are just parameters that we specify in our linear regression model, or just any model that we're trying to fit, it, right? So in the case of the SGD regressor function, there are many kinds of parameters that we can specify. So if you look at the documentation of SGD regressor function, you have parameters like loss function, the penalty term, the alpha parameter, and L1 ratio, and there's actually many more which I won't go into too specific today, All right? So the idea is, uh, we want to try all different kinds of hyperparameter values, right? Because we don't know which hyperparameter values will give us the best performing model. All right, so the idea is we want to try as many hyperparameter values as we can. We want to fit all these uh, different sets of hyperparameter values separately. And then we want to see how each model performs with different set of uh, hyperparameter values that we specify. Yeah, and then we'll then choose the best model, the model with the best hyperparameter values. 
right, based on the performance metric that we specify. So this, in a nutshell, is just hyperparameter tuning. But together with hyperparameter tuning, we have to also take into account uh, this thing called cross-validation in order to avoid overfitting the data. So to understand what cross-validation is, so the motivation behind this thing called cross-validation is that when we train our data, when we split our data, like Pan Pan mentioned before, when we split our data set, we are splitting it to training data and our validation data. But the way we split our data might affect the model's performance. So for example, you can imagine uh, if you split it in one way, maybe the model performance is good. But if you try to take another section of it, if you split it differently, the model performance might not be as good as the first time you split. So model performance is dependent on the way we split out our data, right? And it, won't, it will not be representative of the model's ability to generalize to unseen data. So we wouldn't want our model to fit too closely to our training data, such that it cannot generalize to unseen data, right? So there are many cross validation uh, techniques out there, but the main one we'll be talking today will be K-fold cross validation. So when K equals to one, it will be called one-fold cross validation. So one-fold cross validation would just be a simple, or you split the training, you split the data set into a training set and a test set. But uh, when K equals to three, then you have three fold cross validation. When K equals to 10, you have 10 fold cross validation, right? So for a more pictorial example of what 10 uh, K fold cross validation is, let's take the example of 10 fold cross validation. So you can imagine this is your entire training data set. So 10 fold cross validation would mean that we're going to split it into 10 equal parts. And out of these 10 equal parts, nine of them will be used as your training set. And the last one will be used as your test set. So this is our first iteration. So in this iteration, what we're going to do is we're going to compute a, the performance on how the model actually performs. So we're going to fit the model with this training set. And then we're going to test, predict the model on this test set. And then we're going to measure the performance. So for example, in this case, we can use uh, R squared as our uh, scoring metric. So this would be R squared. Can be any number, right? Then in the second iteration, we will change our test set, right? Then the other nine will be used as our training set instead. Then again, we will compute our R squared. So you can imagine this R squared might be different from this R squared value here. So we're gonna do this for 10, for 10 times, for 10 times with the test set changing every single time. So in this way, we're actually trying to uh, generalize our linear regression model. So we will, in the, at the end of this 10 fold cross validation, we should have 10 R squared values. So what we're gonna do is with this 10 R squared uh, metrics, we're gonna take the average. And that would be how well that this model performs on average, right? Okay, which brings me to the, hyperparameter tuning part. So how we can conduct hyperparameter tuning in through sklearn is through this function from the sklearn library uh, from the module selection module. So the function is called grid search cross validation or grid search CV, right? So uh, this function, okay, why it's called grid search? Essentially is because you can think of it as if we are searching through a grid. So let's say I want to try uh, two hyperparameters. The, the penalty hyperparameter and the alpha hyperparameter, right? So for the penalty hyperparameter, we have three different values that we can specify. L1, L2, and elastic net. Okay, I won't go into too in-depth about what this means. You can look at the documentation afterwards. And for alpha, it's basically just a range of values. So let's say we take a range of zero to one with the intervals of 0 0.2. So what this function will do is it will take uh, penalty term. So it will, let's say we take L1 as penalty term and we take zero as the alpha term. So with these two parameters, it will fit the model and then it will calculate the performance of the model. So the performance of the model will be 0 0.8716. This is R squared. We're using R squared as our performance metric here. So it will do, it will do the same for every single uh, value that we have. So for L1 and zero, alpha equals 0 0.2, we're going to calculate the R squared also. So we're going to do this for every single value that we have. And then what this function is going to do is it will pick the parameters 
it will give us the best performance, best performance metric. So R squared in this case would be the higher the better, closer to one. So this will be our best performance performing model. And the parameters that would give us this best performing model would be when penalty is elastic net and when alpha is specified at 0 0.2. Okay. Yeah, so the limitations about this uh, function would be, you can imagine if you're just trying one hyperparameter and you're giving a range of 10 values, let's say, and you're conducting a three-fold cross-validation. You can imagine uh, in, in one try, you're fitting it 30 times. So it's basically one times 10 times three. So you're fitting it 30 times. But if you have five hyperparameter values, and each hyperparameter you are specifying uh, 10 values, so total 50 values, right? Then if you're using 10 fold cross validation, you'll be fitting the model 2,500 2, times, right? So it's a lot of computations. So uh, this function, uh, the beauty of it is you, you wouldn't have to fully understand uh, each parameter to use this function. You can just try to specify as many parameters as you want and see which parameters will give you the best performing model. But of course, uh, if you have background knowledge on what each hyperparameter is and which uh, set of values will give you the best performing model, then you can actually uh, minimize on the number of fits that you're trying to make through this function by not providing as many parameters as you can, just providing the hyperparameters that you know would work for this model. But in this case, we assume that we don't know what we don't know what all the hyperparameter values mean. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's go back to the Colette notebook and we can see how to use the bit search C function in action. Okay, so from so to import the bit search C function, we're gonna import it from SKLN model selection. All right, so we're just gonna run this code to import the function. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, how do we specify the type of hyperparameters that we want the function to try to look through? So we have to specify the parameter grid in a dictionary with its key as the parameter name and its value as the values that you want to try. So for example, that I've shown earlier, we're going to use penalty as the parameter and we're going to specify L2, L1 elastic net as the hyperparameter values. Similarly, for the alpha term, for the alpha parameter, we're going to uh, use a range of values. So what this function actually does is um, we're going to generate values, 20 values from 0 to 1. They are evenly spaced. So if you run this code, <clears throat> you'll see that this function here, what it does is it will generate values from 0 to 1, 20 values that are evenly spaced. So you will get to try uh, 20 different values, right? So this line of code, we're going to uh, create an instance of the SGD regressor model again as lean model, linear model. Okay, then about the cross-validation, we're going to import k from similarly from SKLN model selection. Just going to run this code. And so in this function, we're going to specify what kind of k-fold cross-validation we want. So for, since we're doing 10-fold cross-validation, we're going to specify the number of splits to be 10. And for shuffle equals to true, what this uh, argument means is that before we split our data set into 10 equal parts, we're going to shuffle data set, right? So that is actually what it means. So we can just run this code to get the uh, k4 function to compute the cross validation for us. Now, so we're going to start the hyperparameter tuning now. So to this grid search CV function, there are four main arguments that we will specify. So the first argument is the estimator, otherwise known as the model you're trying to fit. So the model in this case would be our lean model, which is our SGD regressor function. We're going to specify our parameter grid. Right, which is our the values that we want to try, which is penalty and alpha. CV, which is cross validation, so the basically the number of cross validations we want to execute. 
Okay, for this scoring metric, how we can how do we know to specify this? So if you look at the grid search CV function, if you look at documentation, right? If you scroll all the way down to a scoring, you see uh, this is the strategy to evaluate the performance of our cross validated model on a test set. So you see here the scoring parameter. So you can click onto this and you can actually see all the different kinds of scoring parameters that we can specify. So it's for classification problems, for clustering problems. But the main one we're going to focus today will be on regression. So if you look at regression, you can see these are the metrics that we have. And the most familiar one would be mean square error, right? And you have R2 score here as well. But for now, we'll be using mean square error. So for these two mean square error, you realize that there is one negative mean square error and negative root mean square error. Essentially, what both these are is just mean square error and root mean square error with a negative sign. So don't be too bothered about these negatives here, right? So we'll be using negative root mean square error for our performance metric in the grid search function because it's the most intuitive um, scoring metric that we can provide. So let's go back to the collect notebook. Yeah, so under the scoring metric, we're going to provide negative root mean square error as a scoring metric. So we're just going to run this <clears throat> and it should be quite fast. The reason why it's so fast is because we only, uh, the parameter grid that we are searching through is quite uh, less. The hyperparameter the hyperparameter values that we specify, they are only uh, 3, 20, 3 times 20, 60, 60 times 10. So, so there's only 600 fits that we are doing here. So it should be quite fast for the computer to do 600 fits. Right, so after we've run this model, now this new model, <coughs> what we're going to do similarly to uh, what Pan Pan did just now to fit the model. So to fit this model, we're going to fit uh, with the scale X training data and the y train data. So just going to fit this model. <clears throat> okay, so after we fit the model, how do we get the best parameters? How do we know what are the best parameters? So in the model itself, we can actually extract out the best parameters using this method here, best params. Okay, we can actually also extract out the best model together with the parameters using best estimator method. Right. And similarly, we can find out what is the best score using the best score method from the new model. Maybe there's a way to buy it. Yes. Yeah. But I will, I will I'll do it this way so that you know which are the fun methods to, uh, specific methods to extract out specific uh, items that you want. Right. right. So when we see this, we know that it's done fitting. So when we call the best params, we find out that our best parameters is when alpha is equal to zero and when penalty term is specified as L2. Right? Similarly, for best estimator, it's just the model together with its uh, best parameters. Now, you might be wondering why there is no uh, penalty term here. But that's because in the SGD regressor function, by default, uh, the penalty term is set as L2, which is why you don't see penalty term L2 here. <coughs> And we can actually see the best score that the grid search function has chosen. So if you ignore the negative sign, the root mean square error is actually 1.82, which is better than we did before just now. I think the value just now was uh, 2.03 for our root mean square error. Right. Okay, so with this uh, new model, right, the, the best chosen model, we can actually predict using our uh, predict function and we just have to specify the scale x test values. So we're just going to run this and we should get the new y predicted values based on our best model. So we can compute the new root mean square error and the new R2 score uh, using the same method. So we're just going to use mean square error, pass in the y test values, the y, actual y values and the new y prediction values and square root it to get a new root mean square error. And for the R2 score, similarly, it's just R2 score specifying the actual Y values and the predicted Y values. <clears throat> and you will see that it's actually exactly the same as we did before. 2.030.944. 2.030.94. So the reason why this happens is because uh, one possible reason would be because 
we are not speci specifying enough hyperparameter values. And actually, uh, the, these two hyperparameter values that we specify, right, um, the best ones are already the best ones by default. Yeah, so actually, if you look at the default values for SGD regressor, right? SGD regressor by default penalty is L2 and alpha by default is 0 0.0001, which is very close to zero. Right, so actually the default parameters will give us the best model already. Right, but if we were to specify even more hyperparameter values, the, the scoring that we see here, the root mean square error that we see here might change. Might be, might be even better, right? Okay, so, so this line of code is doing the same as before. We're just visualizing how well uh, our model predicts the Y uh, values. Right? Okay, so right now is your chance to actually improve your model. So below here, we so just had to run this code here to create an instance of your model. And you can actually specify your own parameters that you want to try. So how you can how to know which what kind of parameters you can try. So you just have to look at the SGD regressor function documentation. So uh so let's say I want to use this uh, loss uh, function here. So you can see that these are the this is the loss function to be used, and the possible values are squared error, tuber, all these possible values here. Right? So actually you can just copy and paste all these. Right. So let's say I want to try all these four values here. So in the parameter grid. So you, the name that you specify must be the same. So if here says loss, you have to specify loss here as well. So it'll be loss. And then you specify the values as a list. <clears throat> right, so this is how you can specify the values that you want to try. Basically, the parameter value that you want to try and the list of values that you want to try. Right, so you can do this for, you can try a lot of other terms. You can try penalty, alpha, L1 ratio. You can try uh, epsilon. You can even try the learning rate. So you can specify different uh, values of learning rate and see uh, which is the best learning rate that actually will give you the best performing model, right? So yeah. So after you have specified your parameter grid, then you can choose how many uh, cross code validations you want to execute by providing the number of splits here. And then you just have to run this code. So the more parameters that you specify, clearly the longer it will take because it has to search through all the values and then try to fit the model uh, each time, right? Yeah, so I think now we have some time, so you can try to uh, specify your parameter grid here and see whether you can improve the model that we had before.
Oh, do I have any questions? Anybody needs help? Okay. No. Did anyone manage to get a better performing model? Sorry? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Actually, in real actual data sets, to get 9.4 R squared is quite, 8.94 R squared is quite rare. Sorry? Yes, we need a good question. So if you can see on my screen here, right? I'm just trying um four values for the loss function, 30 values for L1 ratio. Uh, three values of penalty term and 20 values for alpha parameter. And you can see it's taking quite long, longer than what we uh, had just now. I don't know, I didn't want to mess too much. Yeah, so if you all see this warning here, right? Convergence warning. So it means that um, the hyperparameter that you specify, right? It's uh, the specific set of hyperparameters that you specify, right? It's taking too long to reach convergence. So probably, right? What you have to do is you have to look at the max number of iteration function. So, uh, yeah. So by default, max iteration is 1,000. So you probably have to increase max iterations. The max iter parameter in this SGD regressor. So you probably have to change. So in this, in your parameter grid, you probably have to try different kinds of a, a max iter values. Right, so in order for the, the function to actually reach, in order for the model to reach convergence, uh, yeah. So did anyone get a better R squared? Or if you, if, if you used like, any other scoring metric, like maybe root mean squared error, do you get a better root mean squared error? Is there any point? Sorry? Should you change the number of maximum iterations? Or can I? Yeah, so you want me to change now? Uh, I mean, you can, but I'll let you do it yourself. Yeah, because I wouldn't want to stop this now. 
Yeah. But it's it'll be more it'll be preferable if in the in the instance of the SGD regressor model, right? You already specify your number of iterations to be quite large. So at least uh, you don't have to specify in your parameter grid. So you can actually place your max eater here. Right, you can put max eater. Let's say you can put 100,000, right? And then you create an instance of this uh, function which has max, iterated, max iterations 100,000. Yeah, then you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have run into the problem of this. You have any questions regarding this last part of the uh, workshop? Yeah, so if you are doing a uh, hyperparameter tuning for any other model, let's say you are doing logistic regression or you are doing a uh, support vector machines, it will be exactly the same. So what you will do is, let's say I'm doing a, uh, you know, let's say I'm doing logistic regression, right? So you can imagine a grid, the parameter grid, right? We have penalty, L1, L2, elastic net, none. Right, you can specify your C value, which is the inverse of regularization, regularization strength. Right, you can provide a range of values, zero to one. You can provide the algorithm that your logistic regression uh, model wants to use. There's uh, one, two, three, four, five here. Yeah, so you will do it the same way. You specify the parameter values. You specify the type of parameter they're using and the values that you want to try. And you should work on any model they are trying to fit. Okay so, okay, so in conclusion, so what have we done in this workshop? So we have gone through the motivation behind linear regression and the concepts, the main concepts and theory behind uh, linear regression. And we have gone through some basic data preprocessing, like removing uh, NA values. So we cannot have any NA values in our data set when we fit the model. Right, and we also don't want any unnecessary columns, right? So, uh, you might be wondering just now in the country, in the data set in the country column, country columns, right? Why can't we just provide a country name, right? Uh, the main reason is because the your models they only accept uh number values, right? They can't read in strings, so that's why we did the one hot encoding to uh, so that let's say if the country is Singapore, then you have in the country Singapore column, you have one and then for other columns, you have zero, right? So uh, if you want to find out how we did that, uh, I won't go through it here because that will be under feature engineering machine learning, right? But if you want to know how we did it, actually, I think we did it through the pandas function, under the pandas uh, library, we use the function get dummies. So you can actually look up on get dummies on the documentation and find out how to use the function to get to execute one hot encoding. Right. And then the third thing that we did is to split our data into our training and test set. Right. So it's important to split into training and test set so that we don't fit uh the model fully on the on the entire data set. We have we leave our test set to see actually how well our model actually performs. And then the fourth thing that we did is to standardize our training and test set, right? Then we create and fit a linear regression model and we make predictions with our model. And then 
So, and then lastly, we did, we assess the performance of a model based on those three metrics that you see, mean squared error, root mean squared error, and R squared. So there are a lot more other metrics out there, but these are the three main ones that we focus today. Right, and then we try to improve our model through hyperparameter tuning and cross-validation. Right, 